Thank you for tuning into the Good Reap. Oh, <laughs> Thank you for tuning into the Good Reap. My name is JT. Today, I've been promising you guys for like the last month to get somebody interesting. And after we had the other Wilbur, who's pretty cool, you know, great comedian, very talented comedian. I, I think he has a lot of potential. Also, great writer. We have a man here right now. He has a new book coming out on June 28th, exact 14 days right now. Um, it's called The Age of Vent. He's also the famed writer of a great series. I was reading the first book of it a few weeks ago, The Death of the Swords. But I don't know how to pronounce the actual name of the series correctly, so I'm going to ask him during the interview. We have here Michael, Michael J. Sullivan. How you doing, my man? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on. And the word you're trying to figure out is Rira. It's rye in the bread, ear is the body part, and ah, that's how you say Rira. Did you get did, did you get it from combining rye in the bread and rye in the? Uh... <laughs> no, that's an easy way to get people to understand. Actually, I got that because I, I, when I write words and end words, I concerned about how they look as well as how they sound because quite often a lot of people will just kind of register something and how it looks on a page, not quite so much as how it actually sounds. Some people sound it out, everyone does. So when I was doing it, I wanted the, the word to look interesting and not be terribly long. So I wrote it out the way I wanted it to be, and then I ran it through my computer to see what it would sound like. And it came out Raira. And then I took it over to my daughter, who had a bunch of friends over, and had them all try and pronounce it. And one came out Raira, another one came out Raira, another one came out Raira, and I was I was happy with that. So it, it, you can pronounce it other way. The way I do it is Raira. You know, and I'm glad you say that because before I actually um, took the time to set up the interview and everything, I was going through your website and I read the blog post that you did um, for Asia, and I was noticing like the way that you write your prose. Is really like um, it's really attention getting. Like how you said the, the first uh, the first sentence I really like was you said in a time of sense of time of I forgot it was it's a time of progression. It was something like sense of time of I can't remember how you put it, but it was something that really struck me. Like wow, he's he's really trying to get your attention with each sentence, and it actually works. Wait, which book are we talking about here? It's Age of Myth. It's the blog post. Oh, Age of Myth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was um. Yeah, actually, the interesting about that is there's. It has a little quote at the start of each chapter, and I've seen that done in other books. I, I generally have not found it to be useful, but <laughs> in this book, it actually serves in a very specific purpose, uh, which I won't give away here, but it actually has multiple reasons. One of the one of the huge benefits of it was it allowed me to put some exposition into the book that I wouldn't normally put into the prose, but since I can drop it in there, it gives you a, little, a quick little you know additional a bit of information that you might need to know, but it also has some other reasons, but... Yeah, normally I don't like that being done in books, but in this case, I found a really good purpose for it, so that's why I dropped it in, which is what you're trying to remember was that first opening of that quote. Yeah, and you know what? I like—I generally like when books um, have... I like when books have good quotes, but I hate it when it's like a page of poetry before each chapter. And, yeah. And I like, I like poetry sometimes, but I don't like when it's like, you know, golden leaves fall on the haze of the earth. That's what my <laughs> lover said to me. But it's a crime story. I'm like, I don't get what, what was what was the point of that, right? So the anyway. ones that actually are pertinent usually to the chapter, if not the chapter, then the whole story. So it, it's kind of it's insightful and it will set up what's coming, and it sometimes gives you added information that you wouldn't get otherwise. So that made it actually kind of utilitarian purposes, not just artistic or poetic. Mm, exactly. So tell me a little more about yourself. Um, where are you from? Originally, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Woo! Born and raised. Damn, that's a that's a rough one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when I left and I moved out. Uh, I moved to Vermont, and people asked me why I left Detroit, and I said, "Have you been there?" <laughs> <laughs> and that that was many years ago. That was before the more current problems. But yeah, so yeah, I moved to Vermont. Was there for about seven years. Then uh, went down to, <clears throat> excuse me, North Carolina. Oh, really? And was there for about 12 years. And then we moved up here to Washington, D.C. area, just uh, northern Virginia. So that's where I'm located at the present time. Okay. It's interesting you say you moved to North Carolina. My family is actually from North Carolina. Oh, really? Where about? Mo- Moxville and Salisbury. Moxville and Salisbury. Um, my family, if you go to Mox, if you go to Moxville, I mean not Salisbury. If you go to Salisbury, there's actually like a big plantation out there. My family, the Bulwer family, that's ours. Oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. We we left there. That was a little bit too hot. 
Yeah, yeah. You, know, you, never, you never get much snow, very rarely. Mostly you get ice. Uh, so the, the kids, I had kids, they never actually saw much snow until we got up here to Virginia. We have a little bit more of a full season. Mm. Oh, sorry. Some, uh, my microphone was tripping. So anyway, um, what the brought Aliens you? invading. <laughs> well, let me make sure. Let me make sure. Hopefully, it wasn't uh, aliens. I'm gonna make sure this audio is working. I, I hate to do that. Let me see. Okay, say something again. Hello, how are you? Okay, good. We're great. It's already there. Cool. So, and what got you into writing? What got me into writing? Well, um, <clears throat> originally, I I was one of those kids who hated reading, and uh, I determined one day when I was about 13 years old that I was going to read a book so that one day when I was like, you know, 60 years old, I could claim that, yes, I actually did read an entire book cover to cover. That was going to be my claim to fame. Mm -hmm. Um, So I tried (laughs) reading a book called Big Ben and it bored me to tears. Uh, I was about a a boy and his dog type of story and it was just boring as hell. Like the Lassie stereotype? What's that? Kind of like the Lassie story? Yeah, yeah, it was just it was just terrible. But then I I found a book called The Hobbit mm. by Tolkien, and I picked that up. And uh, this is something my brother had loved when he was a kid, and I was like six years old, and he kept showing it to me. So when I saw it again at thirteen, I was like, "This means something." I could vaguely remember it, so I picked it up and read it, <clears throat> and uh, it led into the Lord of the Rings. I got done. I love the Lord of the Rings. Fell in love with it. Read it for like a month uh, from one to the other. That's how slow a reader it was. When I got done with it. I went, this is fantastic, reading is wonderful, and I went to the bookstore to get another one, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and oddly enough, back in, this is about 1975 or so, uh, there weren't any other books like Tolkien, Mm -hmm. and I, so I picked up other books, and none of them were as good, I just like, well, this is, this is not fun, this is not what I was looking for, so at that point, I started writing my own books, and I mean, I started writing really thin books, thicker and thicker, and by the time I was graduating high school, I was writing typical novel length books wow so i like that story i really like that backstory like that's interesting like you you went somewhere and when you didn't find what you wanted you said you know what well i'm gonna create it then yeah i actually ended up trying to finish or do like a sequel to tolkien and then i realized that was kind of stupid so (laughs) i decided to write my own yeah you never know it might have been better than the first i mean i'll i'll be honest with you I'm a real, real big J.R. Tolkien fan, but I've always been a fan of his, his uh, history of Middle Earth works rather than his oh. Lord of the Rings works. Oh. Yeah, I've, I was, uh, I was the, I was the fan of like the Silmarillion and the Book of the Lost Tales. Even to this day, I read them. I'll go to them, and um, I just go, I just go back to them just to kind of get that sense of feeling again. So, but you never know. You might have been able to add some revamp to him. His son might have got mad at you. <laughs> I. I... I found the Cimmerillion a little bit too textbook like. I mean, it had a, a few good stories in it, but it was a little bit, a little bit dry. Like, like an encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah. Like you read it, like it didn't really have like a. Um, I know what you're trying to say. It didn't really have like a, a story. It wasn't any real tales. It was more of just explaining what was going, explaining in what was going on. Exactly, which is more or less what the Age of Myth book that you're talking about is. Uh, that whole series is essentially going back in time and providing the origin story of the universe, which I created that, you know, I actually carried on with the Raira books that come out later. But this kind of goes all the way back to the beginning of time and explains how everything came into being. But instead of being in the Cerulean style, it's written as an actual story. Uh, you know, let's talk about that, because when in your first book of the Raira series, when you first open the first two or three pages... You see, you can see how you actually have like a list of the worlds and of the places where people go to, like Apella Dorn or um, the other one, the Banran Akebelago for the goblins. And, and did I pronounce that right? Um, actually, I'm not sure what you're referring to. You're referring to the opening of the printed room that's got like a list of things. Mm, yes, that one, Theft of the Swords. Okay, yeah, and... that, that, that's something my publisher put in. So I not. Oh, okay. Like, Oh, okay. Well, but they, they were just listing terms, I guess, so it would make it easier for you to understand what goes in the book. I don't think you really need it, but that's what they dropped in. Yeah. I don't think you really need it, but I will say that was one thing with Tolkien that he messed up with, I think, is he had a lot of areas where he dropped stuff in and you really didn't know what was going on unless you read, read the history of Middle Earth. But I was going to ask... Yeah, well, I, have, I have the... Uh, there's a gloss 
glossary in the back, which I did include just in case anyone had a problem with it. Because when I originally wrote these, I wrote them as uh, self-published books, and so 70,000 people kind of read it and gave me feedback, and they all said, you know, we'd really be love to have a glossary. And the reason that they wanted the glossary, you know, I didn't want to have it in there because I didn't want people, you know, spoiling the story. But as it turns out, <laughs> people who went, you know, had waited to read the second book, and they forgot, and they would just go back, who was that person again? Oh, right. So it was more of a refresher, a reminder as they went through the series, which I could understand. So that's why I made sure that I had the glossary in it. Okay. Now tell me more about this universe that you made. I really want to know, I really want to hear from the artist's point of view, like, how did you create this? What influenced it or just everything about it? How long did your show? Um, we have about 18, <laughs> we have 18 minutes. What do we have? We have 18 minutes? Okay. I'll try not to tell you everything. <laughs> um, originally, you know, I started writing this when I was bored. Um, that's usually how most creative things, I think, get started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I started, I was reading, uh, I was in northern Vermont in a small trailer because I was rather young. We didn't have a lot of money, and I had a wife and a young daughter, and we were desperate and kind of living in this little trailer. And uh, when the deep Vermont winters were pretty darn cold, so I just sat in there and, and I was reading. European history, Western civilization. And uh, as I was reading, I mean, I, I was kind of like history when I was in school, and I picked up this, I think it was like a college textbook, and I was reading it. And as I read it, I discovered things I didn't know about before, uh, things like uh, the Enio Domini, which were uh, people that Charlemagne to send out to the various portions of his realm as sort of like secret agents, and they would observe what his governors or the lower kings were doing, and if they didn't do what he wanted to do, they would kind of report back in. So I was kind of scared of these people. I thought, what a great concept that I never even heard of. Mm -hmm. And I would, whenever I stumbled across these things, I would jot them down in notes. And I just kept making this large notebook of all these interesting little tidbits of facts and history that I thought, you know, if I could take those things and kind of put them together in a story, I could do some really fun things. And uh, so I just kept compiling this, and uh, you know, I also, you know, once upon a time played Dungeons and Dragons, and and of course I read Tolkien and all those things. And I used to love old nineteen, you know, sixties uh, television shows, and into the thirties like Errol Flynn or or uh, you know any kind of a swashbuckling shows. I used to like those in movies, and, and so it all kind of came together. And I had this. I was kind of depressed one day. Uh, as many things were going wrong at the time. And I must have wrote to my friend that I was not happy. And he's, he tried to cheer me up by writing me two paragraphs in a story. And he said, we're going to do a chain story. You know, we were just right back and forth. I said, fine. So he wrote two paragraphs where two guys walk into a bar. Mm -hmm. That was it. So I wrote back describing the characters that one's big, one little. And I gave one a name and called them Hadrian. Another one I called them Royce. And then he wrote like another paragraph back. And then I wrote like three pages, and he wrote another paragraph, and I wrote like 18 pages. And <laughs> pretty soon, I started rewriting all of his things, which he didn't like because uh, yeah, he was not happy with it. And my brother, he was very upset. My brother says, well, were they better when you got done writing? He goes, well, that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is kind of how the genesis of the characters picked up. And then many years, a decade went by, and I wasn't writing anymore because I had gotten really depressed about the concept that I had spent a decade of my life uh, doing nothing but writing and getting absolutely nowhere. So I had kind of given up because for me it was like Linus and the pumpkin patch. I'd been waiting for the great pumpkin to show up and he never did. And I figured I just kind of wasted a decade. I wasn't going to waste any more. So I gave up on that. And uh, for how about a decade I didn't, I didn't write. I refused to write. But I kept thinking in the back of my head, these two characters, this you know big kind of mercenary type and this little sort of thief type, and I kept picturing them going up this tower to steal a sword and finding out that they've actually been set up, you know, to take the fall for the death of the king. And I thought, what a great way to start a story. It's very quick. It's right into it. You're immediately invested in what's happening. Oh, that's a great way. And I kept thinking, at the time, I was watching television shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer or mm, Babylon 5, which, which, which have a long story arc. And I, Babylon 5, he actually sketched in the entire series for five years, never even knowing if, you know, he would get through the first season, which was really crazy and I thought you know no one's ever done anything quite like that on television for fantasy before and I thought well, that would be great to do that and I, I kind of decided how I would have done it if I was a movie producer or a television producer it's like I would have it be five seasons long and these little stories would happen and it would all culminate this way 
And I thought, it's a shame I'm not a television producer. And I thought, oh, but you know what? I can write books. And each novel could be like a season. And overarching the whole thing could be a really cool story. But each book could be a complete story. And I don't know if I've ever done that before. So just for the heck of it, I got bored as usual, and I just started writing. Mm. So I created, and as I created the characters, the world got bigger, and I kept stealing from ideas that I had had from that original notebook and maps I had drawn just for the heck of it because I didn't have anything else to do. And eventually it created this this really long, what turned out to be a six-book series, even though I thought I was going to have five. Mm. Interesting. Oh, you're, you're, I was waiting for you to keep going. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's... That's a really fascinating path. Now, I wanted to ask you also this. With the books that you have written, and forgive me if some of these questions kind of come off of random. It's just The more you've explained it, more questions start popping up in my head. Like, oh, I want to ask this. Uh, how you said that, you know, you had went through a moment where you were down kind of a little bit and writing kind of served as a way for you to kind of get out of it. But even you also went through struggles. How much do you feel the creativity of your writing comes from negativity? And not saying that you, not saying that the characters are negative, but how much do you feel came the creativity came from you being in a dark place and you needed some type of light to bring you out of it? Uh, not not much at all, really. It what it really does is it fills a vacuum of time. Um, like I said, I I was in a position where uh, I had a company <clears throat> and I and I closed it, and for a while I didn't really have much to do, and I was really kind of bored. And just to fill time, that's what I ended up doing. So I ended up writing, and I ended up writing a lot. I mean, I would get up in the morning, and I would write, and then I would stop for lunch, and then I would write, and then I'd stop for dinner, and I would write, and I'd go to bed, and I'd get up, and i start the whole thing all over again. <laughs> I literally wrote my first book in one month, and I wrote my second book in the next month. That's how fast I was writing, because I had such pent-up creativity, because I refused to write for 12 years, right. and yet... I'm, I'm a writer, so it just kept building and building and building until finally, when I had nothing else to do and I, and I just couldn't prevent myself from doing it, I just kind of exploded and just kept writing. Uh, after that, I slowed down, but initially that, that was a pretty quick thing. But no, it never really comes from, if I'm really depressed or if I'm really upset, I, I really can't write. I tend, to, I tend to enjoy writing. It's something I do for fun. It's not something I do necessarily to get out of a bad, uh, a bad place, uh, although... I've never really had too bad of a situation where that would really be something I would want to do. I mean, I heard like Stephen King when he got hit by the car when he was on a bike that that helped him get through it. And I don't know if that would work for me. Uh, hopefully, maybe that will work if I ever find myself in that situation. But for me, it really gets me through those times when I just you know I just nothing's interesting to me. You know, I'm not interested in, in doing much of anything else. I, I can go into writing, and go into my own world, and, and things. You know, I just I have a blast there. Well, it's kind of different with Stephen King because Stephen King, Stephen King's genre of writing kind of can is I think can is supposed to be inspired by negative events to an extent. But I was asking that because I've noticed like with a lot of people, whether they were writers or painters or songwriters, a lot of their greatest like you ever heard that uh, that saying, or it was, it was some record label they had. I think it was the record label that signed the Beatles at the time. And they had two songwriters in the label, and they had locked them up in a room. And they said, they're de- they said, why did you lock them up in there? They said, to depress them so they can write better songs. <laughs> so it- now, now, that doesn't mean that, I mean, <laughs> some of the best portions of my books are when I'm drawing from bad things. Uh, I, I realized early on what I call real magic when you're writing. I mean, you can write and you can make pretty things. But when you, when you draw from something of personal... Uh, pain or personal uh, reflection that something is real even though it's a fantasy story but when you're actually putting something down on paper that's that's something that means something to you personally even though the audience will never know that it's yours that's what really resonates those are the most powerful portions of the book and I remember when I first did that I embarrassed myself I'm like I'm sitting in my alone in my room writing this thinking I really can't put this out there because people will read this and think I'm crazy or think worse of me or or think less of me in some way and uh but when i got done with it i was like it was so powerful and so moving even for me to read it that i went wow i've got to leave this in and see what happens and i did it's one of the sections that most people read and they really love and never have they ever thought, well you're a really odd person that you would think that or you would feel that. <laughs> and most people reflect it's interesting because most people have similar feelings so if you feel strongly about something most other people will as well and they'll reflect the same concept of that emotion 
So I've been able to tap people's emotions in my books by tapping their own emotions. And usually I do that by finding something that's, that affected me in a very strong way. Putting that in the clothes of the fantasy story that I'm writing. Fascinating. Interesting. And so I like it's kind of like you're in a way kind of like a, um, a psychologist, like a fictionary psychologist. Like you can kind of touch people's psychology in a strange way by the characters that you create and by the worlds that you create. Interesting. Well, there's one book I wrote called Hollow World. It's the only science fiction novel I've I should say that I published. I've written many different stories in many different genres. Like I said before, I got published, but when, since I got published, that was the only one that science fiction in a novel form that actually was published. And that one is to be what I consider to be a Roy shot test. Uh, how you react will probably say a great deal more about you than the book itself. Um, it is supposed to be a future, uh, look into the future. And depending on who you are, you may look at that and come away thinking, the future is a dystopia or the future is a utopia and it depends on who you are and i've had people who have read that book and come back to me and said you know you're uh you know you're you're the, you're, you're a right winger or you're a left winger or you're pro-religion or you're against religion or you're homophobic or it, it just or you're you're you're, you're pro-gay is like Everyone will look at that book, and so many people come back with completely different ideas. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact of what luggage they bring to them when they read it. And that was the intent, because the whole purpose of that book, in my mind, was I had talked to my mother one day, and she had said, you know, the future is terrible, and the past was great. And I thought, that doesn't even make sense. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you just look at things, everything has steadily always gotten better. It has not gotten worse. And I kept thinking, you don't, what will happen in the future when the things we have now that you like are gone. And I kept thinking that if a world was created in which all the things that we say we don't want, like war or poverty or racism or you know uh, class differences, if all of that was erased, would we still embrace that or would we hate it because we'd have to lose other things? Like if you were going to have no more wars, maybe there'd be no more countries. And would people be upset to lose patriotism? And, and things like that would be an issue for a lot of people because it would be a different world. Maybe it would be a better world, but would you be willing to trade off what you have? So that's kind of what it became, and that actually was sort of a scientific kind of a philosophical or, or psychological you know, uh, dilemma to see how people would take it. And actually, it, it has been quite interesting to see how people have reacted. Some people love that book. Other people reject it. And it's just fascinating. Some people think it's this, this nightmare scenario, and other people think, I want to live there now. So it's just it's <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to buy that one now. I'm curious. I'm, it, has me, it has me questioning my morality right now. Like, am I a good person? <laughs> I mean, I voted on Tuesday. I felt good. Um, another thing I wanted to ask is, when you're creating your work, are this, is there certain boundaries that you know that you have to follow or a certain amount of boundaries that you have of how far you can create something or how how imaginative you can have a world or how contradicting you can have it to the real world? Uh, no. Uh, I try for sure. See, when I, when I write a book, I want the story to be one that is easy to read. I have, too often, and particularly in the world of fantasy, people uh, have a tendency to not want to read fantasy just because they don't want to have to go to the trouble of learning a new world, learning a new history, learning a new economic system and a new religious system and all that. And they're like, you know, mm. I already know this one that we have in this world. Can I read a book that has to do with the real world? I don't want to have to invest that kind of time and effort to learn a fantasy world. And that, that, that's, there's something very true to be said to that because when you pick up a fantasy book, a lot of them begin, and, and this has been traditional from like the 70s all the way through the 80s, where you pick up a book that you have a huge prologue usually. If you've seen the movie Lord of the Rings, they have that big, you know, overdubbed uh, voice uh, telling you the whole history of Lord of the Rings because mm -hmm. it's getting you up to speed so that they can then tell you the story. Right. And I've always hated that in books. I want to open a book and from the first page, I want to be sucked in. I want to know who the character is, what they're doing, why they have having trouble doing it, and be completely invested and just want to turn the pages. That's that's the kind of book I like to read. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is what I was looking to do with my books, so I don't want to have to, you know, mess around. And uh, what was your question again? Because I think I got derailed. Oh, no, I, I guess I should explain a little bit better. I was targeting because... A lot of times, what I've seen with fantasy writing, even when I did writing, is when you create a world, 
there's always that wonder of that's always that feeling to when when you do it as if I want to make it really cool or I want to make it all this and that, but I still want to make it understandable for somebody to understand right. what's going right. on. Now I know what I was going to say, which was that. So what I want to do in order to make it so that you can just start reading and not have a problem was I wanted to keep it in a language that readers could immediately identify. Now, when I created my my fantasy story, uh, Orbit, the, the publisher who had picked it up after it had been self-published for a while, they came back to me and they said, well, don't you want to like change things like the word castle to something else or the word king to something else or knight so you can make this more your world and not you know just the standard tropes that are out there? And I went, no, that's totally counterproductive for what I want because what I want to do is I want to make it so that when I tell you castle or king or knight, you know what that means. So you don't have to try and translate these words. Mm-hmm. I want you to know the values that are out there. So when I tell you the story, you can focus on the story, not the definition of words. Because what usually happens is people will have a different word for something that exists, and they'll go, oh, so that means, you know, king. Oh, I get it now. It's a, it's a useless and unnecessary addition that, that just makes it harder. So I try to make the story as familiar as humanly possible as far as being able to grasp things, because I don't want the reader to fight or struggle to understand what's going on. I want them to enjoy the characters. I want the characters to seem real, believable, like friends they have or enemies they've had, and I want them to have very real you know, conflicts that they can you know, feel about and, and have issues with and want them to overcome. That's where the focus of the story is. I'm not huge on world building. World building is something that, I have to do because it's necessary for the story. It's like building a set for a movie. But I'm not the kind of per- I'm, my, my my books are more about characters and plot and far less about the world and the background. Although the world does end up getting built because I write several books in the same you know in the same universe, so it tends to get huge. Even though I'm not the landscape and the world building is something that I don't put a lot of effort in. In fact, what I try and do, what I really wanted to do, one of the main goals I had when I started writing the book is I wanted, that I'm not going to tell you the world building. I'm not going to tell you anything. I want that to grow up organically through listening to the conversations of the characters, through witnessing what they do. I'm not going to stop and give you a page or two of just explanation of the background of this world because I find that really boring. I also don't want to give you any information as an author until you as a reader want that information because one of the things I discovered was if you give a reader information before they're interested in it, they won't even recognize it. They'll just pass over it. They won't, mm. they won't remember it and, and they'll be completely oblivious to it. But if you talk about this character, you get them interested in it and you don't tell them their background. By the time you get to telling them their background, they'll be very, very interested in finding out. I've always wanted to know what happened to that guy, so they'll, they'll pay attention. But if you don't, if you give them something they don't want, they're not going to be interested. So as far as your concern, uh, your, your question was, I don't have too much trouble with making it wild. I mean, there's some authors who just make their fantasy world so disconnected from reality, it, it's almost impossible to kind of find out what's going on. <laughs> time. I don't like doing that. I like making mine very familiar because my point is not to make a fantastic or even original world. My point is to make good stories with good characters. Interesting. And being that your world is kind of based on an epic fantasy, um, kind of royal knight. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it in a way where, it, but you get what I'm saying, like the royal knight, epic fantasy kind of stereotype in a sense. What is it that you feel sets it apart from a J.R. Tolkien story or from a um, stories of Shannara story? Like, what is it you feel outside of outside of the past that you have of trying to make it relatable? Because that is something that I don't see in J.R. Tolkien's work. Is I don't feel like his work was really. I don't feel like his work, his writing or style was really kind of openly relatable unless you really liked it. Thank God it was a fascinating world, but I don't think it was really open and engaging unless you really liked the world. Well, a lot of the older books, now, now Lord of the Rings was written, you know, in the 30s and 40s. So when you go back to that period, and certainly before, you'll notice that the style of writing has significantly changed between then and now. Uh, mm. I personally feel it's improved. Oh, yeah. Back, if you go back to the like Charles Dickens, you'll notice that all of that writing style is heavy narrative and heavily uh, ex- expositionary. It, it's telling you the story rather than letting you live it. Tolkien uh, took a tradition which was started with people like George MacDonald, who uh, took even older texts, old um, 
things like Beowulf and such, which were very dramatic sounding. You had, you know, the he, thou kind of thing. And George MacDonald brought it into a, you know, kind of a fictional world kind of thing, but it was still was very stilted. It had the very dramatic prose. Tolkien took that and, and trimmed a lot of that out and made it much more readable. Uh, but still, it still has a lot of that stilted, heroic language to it. And that has been, oddly enough, repeated and imitated for decades. Uh, I never found a reason why, because it's just one more you know, thing between the reader and the, the, the words on the page. It, the story, it doesn't really work well for me. Now, people ha- have resisted the fact that I tend to write in a much more casual manner. I write in what I would consider to be contemporary language. Like, well, this is supposed to be taking place in the past. Well, no, not really. It's a fictional world that can take place wherever I want to. But <laughs> uh, the reality is that, let's say I was writing a story that took place in, let's say I was making a movie that took place in Paris. And everyone in Paris is native to Paris. But the movie is going to be for an American audience. Now I have my choice. I could have everyone speak you know, French and then put subtitles in. Or I could have everyone speak English and make the assumption that you know they're actually speaking French. Well, I'm going to go with the English because it would make much easy, it would make it much more easier for people who are watching that film. They're not going to be like, well, why are they speaking English? Well, of course they're not speaking English. You're just hearing English because I'm placing it as something that would be contemporary to you. Same thing's true with my stories. My stories are designed because I don't want the reader to feel like they're in an alien place. Some authors do. I don't. I want people to feel like they've always lived in this world, that this could be a place that they could actually go to. These characters, I want to be familiar to them. I want them to be the type of people who they can relate to, or they could even be. And that's part of that, what I'm trying to do, is trying to make that kind of feel of, of you know, familiarity easier to read. But also, the other thing I did was I wrote it with the better pace, what I consider to be better pace at any rate, which means that I actually took uh, thrillers. Thrillers are fantastic. They get you right into the story. You're immediately you know, vested in it. You want to know what happened. It doesn't ever let you down. It just keeps you wanting to turn the page. I wanted to take that same concept and put it in the form of fantasy so that you, know, you are not having to you know, plow through all the excess information or all these incredibly elaborate descriptions. Just give them enough description to let them see the scene, to let them see the people, let their imagination do the rest, and let them flow the story so that it evolves like a movie in their mind. That was my intent. That was my intent. That's how it is different from the older works uh, because I don't go to that elaborate game to try and describe this world or just describe this ancient history, which really has no point in the story itself. It's just tacked on. Some people like to make a world building and just go on with it and go on with it. And it's like, you know, the reader, I, in fact, I've talked to aspiring writers and like going, how much world building do I do? And like, it's, there's the iceberg effect. You use the very top. You can build that huge iceberg, but you're only going to use that top part that shows above the water. You're only going to use the part that actually affects the story because mm-hmm. most readers don't care about the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's real. But that's true. Or realistically, what happens is also, I see a lot, and I've experienced this too, is you'll spend so much time world building, and you'll put the whole, you'll try to put the whole world in the first book. Really, if you were smart, what you would do is take the tip of the iceberg, like you said, that focuses on the story, and the rest of that story, rest of that iceberg, if you want, if you want to, you can make like four or five of the different books about it. What we call it Cimmerillion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he made, he made he made that whole he made J.R.O. tweaking that. For those of you guys who don't know, because we keep referring to some really, because there's some of you guys who aren't real Tolkien fans. Tolkien had had a series of books outside of Lord of the Rings called History of Middle Earth, and it, and it was like ten different that included Morgoth's Ring, the Silmarillion, Book of Lost Tales, Volume One and Two, Lost Middle Earth, and other writings. But you know, he made like a. He cre- he took a like a this gigantic iceberg and this whole gigantic planet. Forget an iceberg, and he made this whole world. But with the Lord of the Rings, he took a small piece of that and condensed it for you to understand that. He never even right. touched about the rest of the story and the rest of the world that he made. And the other thing that I do a little differently is that I use humor. Um, I discovered that I don't know why, but fantasy seems to lack a lot of humor for the most part. It seems <laughs> to be very heroic, so it's very dramatic, and everyone's always very serious. And no one makes a joke, which doesn't make sense to me because I've often said that, you know, if the best jokes I've often heard are at a funeral, 
<laughs> is because you know people deal with grief, they deal with stress, they deal with fear in the exact same way. Everyone makes a joke because it, it's the only way they know how to deal with it a lot of times. And some of them are really funny. Even though it seems somewhat macabre that you're sitting there, you know, you're in this awful situation and someone cracks and jumping you. Because I had friends who were being booked, you know, by, by police officers and they're, they're actually joking their heads off because they're actually scared to death. But that's how you dealt with it. And in books, in fantasy, people are trying to be more realistic in the treatment, if not the subject matter necessarily. But they lack humor. And without humor, it never seemed real to me. So I needed to have some humor in it to balance off the darkness. If you're going to have dark things, you also have to have light things to balance it. I mean, I grew up in the 70s when they had a lot of horror shows on TV. And it seemed like at the time, everyone was losing. Like, the evil would always win. And you know, I wanted to have one balance where, you know, if it, you can have this really horrible demon, you also have to have something else that can counterbalance it. It never worked out. But I like things that are more balanced. I like, if you're going to have something dark and scary, you got to have people who will make fun of it. You know, there's the whole Buffy the Vampire thing where she would wisecrack while there's a, a vampire attacking her. That kind of thing just seems much more real and legitimate to me than someone who would just be, oh, what thou, you stand back there, I will defend thee. You know, that never really worked for me. It did. That's kind of, that kind of gets played out. That gets very, very boring. That gets boring really fast. Well, also in, in modern day, right now, uh, we have what's known by many people as grimdark. We're taken to a point where... Everything is just so the opposite. There are no heroes. There are there is no you know light, and uh, the the, there are, the the good guys are the bad guys. The bad guys are the good guys. In fact, there aren't any good or bad guys. Everyone's just sort of this weird sort of. Well, actually, no, everyone's the bad guy. When I think about it, and it just it paints a world that is awful. Now, when I when I started writing my books, and I wanted to think of what would make what would I want to read, and I would want to read. I thought of all the books that I really love, the ones that I wanted to reread. And they all had in common the fact that they had a place that I would like to go to. I would not want to go to a lot of the grim, dark worlds because there's nothing good there. It's just scary and bad and evil and disgusting. Whereas, you know, I would like to go to Middle Earth. I would like to go to Hogwarts. I mean, these are places I think were great. Right. I mean, there, there's some bad stuff, too. But, yeah, but there's good stuff, too. And, and, and if you have good things, then you value those and you're afraid of losing them. So you have a greater vested interest in the hero winning. Right. You kind of, yeah, that's interesting. I never thought of it like that. Uh, now that you say Grim Dark, I thought about that. Have you ever read a, a series called um, The Demonada by Darren Sean? No, I haven't even heard of that one. Um, he, he wrote another series called Cirque de Freak. Uh, that's something familiar, but no, I haven't read it. Well, both of them were kind of really popular with the younger crowd. And I brought them up because I used the Grim Dark thing. His second series, Demonada. It kind of had that theme to where the characters were supposed to be heroes, but they were kind of dark at the same time. And the world was so... The world was... It was basically to sum it up in a few sentences. Human world, demon apocalypse is coming, and the demons are escaping through demon world, just destroying everything, they're wreaking havoc. And the heroes kind of suck to some extent, so they're not doing a good job of protecting the world. And I remember talking to my cousin about it, and I was like, man, I would hate to live in that world. I said, I love the story. I love the action. I said, I think it would make a great TV series. But as far as like a book, it's weird when you read it because it's like, I don't want to be here. And that's what I take with writing. Like when I opened your book and I was reading about Elon and all this other stuff, which I wasn't, that's not the question I want to ask about that. But I like to, I like to read a book where I can imagine I want to be there. Nobody wants to read a book. I, this is my personal opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. Nobody wants to read a book and think, you know what, I'd hate to be there. Well, yeah, the, the thing is, is that, I mean, you really wanted, you know, Frodo to win in The Lord of the Rings because the Shire was such a great place. You didn't want to see it destroyed, and they kept you know, alluding to the fact that it would be destroyed. And if you were in Buffy, I mean, all you had to do was threaten Willow. I mean, she's a <laughs> very great character. No one ever wanted to see her hurt, right? So this is how you could really get to the emotions of the, of the viewer or the reader, is that you make something that they cherish, and then you threaten it. But if you are portraying a world where there's nothing to cherish and there's nothing good, then you don't really give it. You don't care. I'm like, a lot of these things, like, I don't care if any of these people live or die because I, I'm not invested with them because they're all awful. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You, you know what? Good example of that. Do you remember Spike? Yeah. Spike. Spike was my favorite character. There was one episode, I don't, I don't know if you remember, I think it was it was the first, second episode of Buffy the Vampire's last season. And it was at that point where he came back and he had got his soul and he was halfway crazy now. And he, he I remember he 
he leaned on the cross and was burning himself to death. And I remember being a kid in my room yelling out, Spike, no! <laughs> and I and I and I and now I look back on it and, and think, damn, I really didn't want him to die. Yeah, and a lot of that has to do with taking a character who was evil and then redeeming them. And those people, I don't know, I think they they tend to burrow more into your heart than a person who is always good. You know, it's like you take someone and you bring them back, and like you really do like them now more than you would have, I think, initially. And then if they start going evil again then you really get upset <laughs> <laughs> right then you're disappointed like okay you haven't learned the first time yeah interesting so now i want to get uh focus more into your new book because i don't want this just to be us having a gossip hour you know we can meet up at starbucks for that um <laughs> what's what's um tell me more about the asian mythology like what's it bringing to the table more like what's it about what's the plot line uh, okay, so the, the original series is about two guys who, you know, take place in, I would say, what would be the equivalent of the 1300s uh, kind of era with knights and stuff. But Age of Myth takes you back to the beginning. Uh, it goes back about 3,000 years. And, and if you've, anyone ever read the original series, they know 3,000 years is a specific timeline because something happened there, which was that's when the first empire was created. Mm-hmm. But when I wrote the original series, I gave you an explanation for how that came about. And it was all lies. Uh, how this came about was a friend of mine, uh, in the very beginning when I started writing, I, I wrote to him how this happened, and he came back and he said, that is, is the most sappy piece of crap I've ever heard. <laughs> the, fact was, the fact was he was right. Uh, there was this whole story about how this guy betrayed his own people for the love of a woman, and it was very type of thing you would expect to hear in a legend or a myth, but in reality, that never would have happened. And so I came up with what I consider to be the real history and where that story came from, the seeds that created that story. And I always had it, and I knew what it was, but I never got around to including it in the original series. So when I wrote these books, I wanted to tell the real story because it was fairly fascinating once I got it done. So I started writing this series that would cover essentially everything from the beginning of time, how the world was essentially made, the different gods, how they interacted, and how everything set up into the culmination of the first empire, which then, by the time you get to the main series, has already fallen and, and been destroyed. But that whole time, sort of like before written history, is what I'm dealing with here. So this, we're talking about an era that would have been the Bronze Age, uh, when... You know, most humans didn't ride horses. They ate them. You know, they're like, you know, (laughs) shoot them, kill them. They wouldn't ride them. Um, And they were just domesticating, you know, uh, crops and things. They were just learning how to use barley and wheat and that kind of thing. Uh, They believed in all the, you know, spirits of the woods. Uh, They didn't have your basic things like bow and arrows. They didn't have swords. They used, you know, spears and shields. That's all they had. And... They believed that certain individuals uh, who had long life would be gods. So this was an era when the human race was just starting to become civilized. So it takes it back to that time period. And then you move forward and you see how humanity has developed over the course of history. It was so fun because I got to rewrite history. I got to tell you how everything was made. Like this one character in the story who's a, a genius. She's a certified genius. And she invents everything that we kind of know. One of them is a pocket. She figured out how to make a <laughs> I mean, every, right down to the littlest things, right? So, I mean, you get to see the origin. But you also, the thing I wanted to do intentionally with this uh, was I was going to tell a story about these great, you know, legendary figures of old. But as I started writing it, the great legendary figures of old became really kind of boring. And I noticed that the secondary characters and the tertiary characters were really interesting. So what I decided to do as I was beginning the story was I realized I actually want to write a story about the people who make history, but history completely forgets about. All the little people, the people who you never would expect to be heroes, actually are the real heroes. But the people who take credit are different people. So that was the story I was aiming for. So I have people who are very unlikely, uh, not the sort that you'd ever see in a fantasy book as being heroes. These are the people who are, you know, handicapped people, women, uh, young people, you know, who just are not normally capable, but come together in a time of crisis and actually make the difference of, of you know, making this whole world the underdogs. a better place and setting up their the underdogs. Focus on the night about the squ- focus on the tale about the squire rather than the knight. I like that. It's interesting. 
And so, like, and so when you say the, when you say like that, you mean like it'll be regular citizens, like not people who are like divinely blessed by some god and saying you have the power to this and this is your destiny. Maybe those people you're talking about those people who are maybe more reluctant or a little bit more cowardice. Well, not even not really cowardice necessarily. I mean, they're they're actually probably braver than the, the heroes, but they have no power. They're they're like Frodo and Sam. I mean, that's a good example. Frodo and Sam weren't really destined to do anything. They were just two hobbits. You wouldn't expect them to have done anything of any significant worth, and yet they're the one who changed the world. And that was kind of the same idea. Was I just wanted to have the average people, the people who weren't great, you know, warriors, who weren't knights or kings. They were just average people, but they're the ones who stepped up when they needed to and changed history. Hmm. Now I want to ask: In the age of, and I don't want, I don't want, I don't mean to spoil it for everybody else, but I'm just curious. I always like to ask this so question. Butler did it. <laughs> oh damn! Do so you mean to tell me they made butlers before they made pockets? <laughs> that is so ass. That is. Who did they have butlers? Didn't have pockets. Oh god! <laughs> so I say, damn. But um, if there was one character in Age of Myth who you feel like you would want to be, who would it be? So yeah, Nothing I get. It's anything to you right now because you haven't read it. No, oh, yeah, no, no. I'm, a, I'm, a, no. I'm definitely buying it. I have, I have to now because now you caught my interest. When you said about how you, how you stretched back three thousand years and you kind of reworked history, that fascinates me because I'm inspired. I'm really inspired by world concept and all that stuff. But I also like when somebody takes something back. Like just to give an example, there's one writer. Her name is Sarah Sarah Griffith Little, and she wrote a book called Forbidden. And the book's not all that to me, but I like how she took the concept and took it all the way back to Mesopotamia time and wrote about a time where you had this, the big, most of Mesopotamian cities, they were always digging and doing, reading about the architecture and all of that. But he took it, she took it to where she focused on the people who were still in desert tribes living outside the cities. And I was thinking about that. Like I had never, I never seen anybody actually write about Mesopotamia in that, in that area and talk about that. It's always been, we've always looked at it as like, there was these ancient cities and these esoteric people who lived there and they believed in gods and that was it. But you never thought about the people outside of that, like the smaller people. Right. Yeah. And, you know, most fantasy tends to be, you know, kings and queens and castles and knights. So I wanted to take it back, you know, well before that time. There are no castles. There are no kings. You know, and I mean, mankind's living in small outposts and little, you know, lodges and longhouse or, or roundhouses and things of that nature. So it was different. It was hard to write because, you know, I don't even have the basic uh, word relations that you would have in a normal fantasy. I couldn't say he ran as fast as a horse because, of course, you know, people were riding horses. <laughs> so there's certain things like that I couldn't do. So it really limited my ability to, to make connections with other ideas. That, that, that was the trickiest part about it. Hmm. <laughs> That's kind of funny. He's like, he can't say he ran as fast as a horse. I wonder what they ran as fast as at that time. <laughs> you know, they didn't have language back then, so it was like probably like, huh? <laughs> well, they, they also didn't even have money. So, I mean, there's a lot of references to money, you know, and that, that you, you take for granted when you're talking, but, you know, you can't use them if there's no money. Hmm. That's true, Tom. All right, so in our last, we have, we're on our last 10 minutes, so this is time I want to take the time to kind of ask you just some little lighthearted questions. You seem to me a man of good humor, so I would want to ask you, who was your favorite comedian? My favorite comedian mm-hmm. of all time. Mm-hmm. Ooh, uh, okay, I'll take I'll, I'll take the pressure off you just a little bit. Who would you say are the top three? The top three. I'm trying to think of one guy. His name I haven't seen him in ages. Like George Carlin's good. Um, there was uh, oh god, I can't remember his name. I just saw him not too long ago. I total total blank on that one. But yeah, I mean, I, I like George Carlin. And, uh, you know, Robin Williams is great. And, uh, Robin. Robin. Uh, uh, maybe Eddie Murphy. Those were some of my favorites. Mm. Robin was Robin was a talented one. Yeah. Um, okay. And Lord of the Rings, who was your favorite character? Oh, I probably... Hmm, I have 
say Gandalf. I'd have to go with that one. I mean, I always, I always paid much more attention to the book, book whenever he was in a scene. Hmm. Interesting. Gandalf was a good one. Now, I've always, I will say this, I always thought that they could have, they could have chosen a better elf to be in the party than Legolas. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. You were hoping for Laura weren't you? Yeah, man, yes. Like, I didn't get the point, like, because Legolas didn't really have a, Legolas didn't have a, to me, Legolas didn't have a personality. In uh, it, he was played by uh, Arwen in the movie, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 like, he didn't have a, you know, Leg, Glor- Legolas didn't have a personality. Legolas just wasn't that cool. And then when you read the other books and you have them compared to these other great and powerful elves, you're like, well, damn, why didn't Elrond send them? Like, the story could have been at least one book shorter, which was, which was maybe why he didn't do it because you know want to make some money. But okay, <laughs> either way. And for you, for your right, for your writing, if there was one goal you could have that would signify that you really have achieved everything that you wanted to be as a writer in the career path that you're in. What would it be? To be able to write novels and have enough people to read them that, you know, neither my wife or I have to work for a living. Oh, right. I've already done that. Oh, oh, okay. So, mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, this is a bragging. I was like, oh, damn. Told me. Um, I have, I have love this. There was another question I wanted to ask you. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you this 20 minutes ago. I have forgotten. When you created Elon, am I pronouncing it right? Elon? Where are you getting the picture, the imagery for it? Where are you getting the imagery for the landscape in that world? Uh, well, you know, most of it would come from, like, you know, the old classics of Britain, but also, like, Ireland. I actually used Ireland's map when I was uh, kind of reconfiguring it for the actual layout. Um, but also, when I was, you know, conceiving a lot of the stories, I was living in northern Vermont, which, if you notice, all three of those are very similar places. <laughs> cool. um, but, yeah, I mean... I was kind of just pulling you know, off a traditional King Arthur style, you know, history, which would be Britain. But yeah, I mean, I also have, I mean, my name is Sullivan, so I have a good kinship to Ireland. I'm only like three generations removed, so there, there, there's some of that in there too. Oh, so you you have actual heritage in Ireland? In Ireland. Yeah, I have my, uh, I actually have relatives who were, you know, born and raised there, and like my grandmother came over when she was like 18 back in the. Yeah, you know, in the twenties, so. Hmm. Interesting. The funny thing about that is, is um, with my family, my mother's side, it was this. This scenario is really old, but I guess there was an Irishman. He came over to America. He ended up buying land. He ended up buying the plantation in Northern Carolina that we have now. And when slavery went out, he had already had a relationship with one of the slaves. So when it went out, I guess he kept it going. And after he died, he passed it on to my great great grandfather, and he passed it on to my grandma, and yada yada yada. And here I am. Some mom in California. Very cool that you have a past that you can trace right to, you know, <laughs> an actual physical place. Like I actually have a cottage apparently that my ancestors have had that it, no, we no longer own it, but we know where it is. It's still there. <laughs> <laughs> the cottage. You can make a story out of that, truthfully. Yeah, especially since there's a there's a story there about a door that's been painted shut and no one knows why. <laughs> Ain't it shut? <laughs> yeah, no, no one's ever opened it. There, there's some story behind you. Don't ever want to open that door, and we don't know why. It's a great story. You, you know what? This will be the last question I ask you. Then I have to um, close it up because we're running out of time. When do you um, do you believe in ghosts? Do I believe in ghosts? Hmm. Uh, probably not. <laughs> but I leave the door open for just about anything. Hmm. Speaking of painted doors, and, and we're on, we're running in our last three minutes, so. Everybody who's been listening, um, we're, I want you to tell them where you can find you at on the social media, like on Twitter or Facebook. On Twitter, you can get me at uh, author underscore Sullivan. Um, on the internet, you can get to my website, which is com. That would be spelled R-I-Y-R-I-A. So com or on Twitter at uh, author underscore Sullivan. And which, by the way, if you guys have a hard time getting to either of those, I'm going to put links to his website and a link to his Twitter and a link to his Facebook page and the episode info on this for SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube, too. So just in case you guys don't know how to type what somebody told you. But, Michael, Michael, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you for really being a great interview. You know, it's always really great to talk to people like you because I like talking to people 
who are great writers, who are successful at what they're doing, but they've also went through struggle. You know, they didn't have to, they didn't have the whole cookie cutter. I came out of high school, just this great talented person. Everything went great for me because <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's because a lot of times, you know what Howard is when you're a writer, or if you're in any field that's kind of creative, you're going to get the door slammed and slammed in your face a lot of the time. And I've always believed it was, this is was something my grandfather told me a long time ago is those who stay are those who play. And so you have to keep, you have to keep going at it. You have to keep going at it. So it's people yeah, like you. I would never suggest anyone try to become a writer the way I did because it took forever. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to it. I finally got there, yeah. That's... So thank you very much for having me. This was wonderful. Yeah, it was a great, uh, great, great podcast. I'm going to tap. Well, I mean, let me close it out. Everybody, thank you guys for tuning in for the podcast. It's been a great moment. My name is JT. This has been Mike or Michael J. Sullivan. Or we're out to Starbucks later on. You can meet us at this uh, location. I'll put that there.